Hello, and welcome to our program, Surgical Pathology, Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, Professor of Pathology at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, and our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, which is a joint venture between the Digital Pathology Association and our good friends at uh, Path Presenter. Uh, our case today comes from the uh, realm that uh, sort of crosses between GI and GU and G GYN pathology, um, and uh, may therefore be a challenge that many of you uh, may face uh, at some point or another um, in some respects, but it's uh, quite unique in others. Uh, it's a 30-year-old patient who was undergoing a uh, routine cholecystectomy and was discovered to have some uh, remarkable uh, peritoneal implants. Uh, these were submitted for frozen section and found to have uh, concerning features. Um, so uh, differential diagnosis of peritoneal implants, uh, certainly uh, the top on the list, of course, is metastatic carcinomas. Uh, we see this as a concern in many situations uh, in patients with uh, known primary tumors, uh, but occasionally it pops up uh, with uh, an unknown case, as in this situation. It's also possible, of course, to have primary peritoneal neoplasms, carcinoma, mesothelioma, et cetera, uh, either uh, derived from uh, mullerian uh, tissue or uh, directly from the mesothelial surface itself. Additionally, we've seen cases where granulomatous disease has very closely mimicked uh, metastatic malignancy and created um, a concern. Now, in addition, there are a few other entities that uh, enter the consideration as well, foreign body. Uh, of course, those would usually fall under granulomatous disease as well as some benign entities. So let's take a look at the uh, tissue in this patient. As you can see here at low magnification, uh, these nodules are quite small, uh, each on the order of uh, probably less than a millimeter in total size. Uh, and thus, these would not be usually uh, visualizable on uh, imaging studies uh, and hence uh, discovered incidentally at surgery. Notice that they have somewhat of a lobulated, stuck-on appearance uh, with a little uh, invasion of the underlying fat. Uh, but as you can look at some of these, you see that they do have a sort of a, an infiltrating contour uh, and that there are some associated inflammatory cells associated with this. Well, as uh, you might expect, uh, this sort of appearance is uh, not something we usually see in the peritoneum. Um, and looking at some of these cells, we can see that, oh, we have a few occasional intracytoplasmic uh, uh, cystic spaces, sort of uh, signet ring type uh, formations. Uh, here towards the periphery, I think you can see a little bit more of this it becomes more prominent or it's a microglandular uh, type of pattern. Uh, and then we have this little uh, gap zone here uh, with uh, some mesothelium on the surface. So uh, looking at this pattern, it looks as though it's forming cords and nests that are somewhat invasive. Um, and we would, of course, be concerned about the possibility of uh, primary malignancy. Looking at the other uh, nodules in this uh, uh, resection sample, we can see again this similar sort of appearance. Here's one that's more circumferentially oriented. And you can see towards the middle of this, it becomes a little bit sclerotic. Towards the periphery, it's more epithelioid with signet ring cells and uh, the uh, features suggesting malignancy. So this is very concerning <clears throat> tissue and would prompt us to look further to characterize uh, what sort of a process this is. Uh, so in the history of evaluating mesothelioma and carcinoma is lengthy. It's one of the first challenges that was tackled by immunohistochemistry. Um, and it still remains one of the uh, challenging areas of uh, differentiation. You can see here on the uh, left a number of uh, antibodies that have been utilized in this evaluation. Um, and uh, 
uh, some of them with greater or lesser degrees of specificity. Um, and of course, availability becomes another issue um, as many of these, particularly uh, things like BAP1 or uh, uh, Clodden 4 and so forth may not be uh, readily available in uh, many uh, tissue laboratories. Uh, a very useful stain, of course, is calretinin, which identifies uh, mesothelial cells and is typically negative in uh, adenocarcinoma. Our cytopathologists also use MOC31 uh, for this same purpose. Uh, it's quite useful in differentiating epithelial versus mesothelial uh, derived tissues. Uh, and then from there, uh, you know, thinking about things that are positive in carcinoma and not in uh, mesothelioma, B72.3, uh, monoclonal CEA, these have been used for quite some time. Um, but BER-EP4 can also be uh, useful. Um, and in terms of defining malignancy, BAP1 can be quite useful as well. So uh, which do we choose? Well, you choose based on the availability that you have available to you because timeliness is important. Um, and so in our laboratory, that was what was done. Um, uh, cytokeratins were uh, ordered, uh, CEA was ordered, um, and calretinin was ordered um, based on our most readily available stains. Uh, in addition, um, some people like the value of uh, conventional histochemical stains like musicarmine as a means of identifying uh, epithelial-derived uh, uh, carcinomas that produce mucin. So uh, we'll just go through a couple of the uh, stains here. Uh, and as you can see, um, we quickly exhausted the tissue. Uh, so here's an example of... Uh, some staining results. Uh, and as you can see, we have minimal uh, truly identifiable tissue remaining in this uh, sample uh, that I believe was, was stained with uh, CEA. Um, we did, uh, uh, were able to identify the cytokeratins and uh, it looked as though on the mucicarmine uh, that we had uh, sufficient sample remaining and as you can see, my uh, colleague here has uh, uh, highlighted an area where we have uh, these nice uh, rounded signet spaces. And it looks like there may be just a hint of uh, mucin uh, in uh, this little vacuole here. It's not very striking. Uh, it's kind of iffy, uh, but on that basis, uh, with a limited sample, we made the diagnosis of uh, adenocarcinoma, uncertain primary. Well, uh, that led to uh, further evaluation, a search for the primary, which was uh, totally unrevealing, upper, lower endoscopy, scanning, and so forth. No masses, no uh, identifiable sites. And, you know, to be quite frank, uh, this patient looked pretty healthy overall. Uh, here we can see, again, another, this was the uh, calretinin stain, and as you can see, I think it's uh, it's pretty well exhausted, uh, the uh, any residual areas. You can see that, of course, we are picking up some of the normal mesothelial cells here, uh, but uh, we have exhausted uh, the sample. So um, after considerable discussion and tumor board evaluations and so forth, the decision was made to pursue additional uh, tissue. Um, and that, in fact, revealed that this was uh, positive for mesothelial markers um, and uh, was uh, clearly uh, presenting with uh, involvement of the mesothelium by this mesothelial proliferation. Um, and in addition, uh, a KI67 stain was performed. Now, uh, that's an interesting choice. Uh, but it showed that, uh, in fact, there was an, a very, very low proliferation rate in these cells. In fact, there was virtually no positivity in these suspect cells uh, that we had been so concerned about on our initial biopsies. The other feature that was of note was that uh, over the several months of time that evolved with this patient, uh, there was uh, essentially no progression no enlargement, 
uh, and uh, no extension of uh, this process to other areas. Now, the other feature that I think is a clue here, and which we saw to a degree in that very first sample, is that it looks as though you have kind of two populations. You have these corded cells with the cystic spaces and microglandular spaces, and then you have these uh, surface mesothelial cells, and they look a little bit different. These look a little more reactive and so forth. These look a little bit more like uh, well, neoplasia, as it were, uh, but somewhat different because they're forming these tubules and, and microcystic spaces. So uh, based on the appearance in this um, issue, um, we wanted to think about, well, if this is mesothelium, uh, is this malignant? Uh, and that can be a challenge in mesothelial cells. So I've listed here the, the features that favor malignancy in mesothelial lesions. Uh, definite invasion. Well, we looked at that in the, initially and it looked kind of more stuck on. Expansion of the stroma, not really. Full thickness atypia, yeah, we've got that here. Malignant cytologic features, possibly. Uh, necrosis, not at all. Uh, fibrin deposition with active inflammation, we didn't see that. Linear arrays and small glands. Well, yes, we do have that. Non-branching, simple glands. Yes, we do have um, mesothelial cells separated by stroma and a very low proliferation rate. So uh, in fact, we have a, a fair number of features here that favor uh, benignancy. And as I looked at this case, I was struck by the similarity to lesions that we see sometimes in the fallopian tube, sometimes in the paratesticular tissues, uh, elsewhere, occasionally in the uterus. Uh, in the uh, in the pelvis, this these looked a lot like so-called adenomatoid tumor. So I began to ask the question: Could this be an adenomatoid tumor? Could this be something that uh, was uh, occurring in multiple sites in a sort of disseminated fashion? Well, adenomatoid tumor is a poorly circumscribed tumor tumor with cuboidal and flattened cells, prominent vacuoles, small cords, occasional channels and most likely seen in the GU tract or the GYN tract. But if you look in large series, you'll also find cases reported in the adrenal, in the liver, in a disseminated fat pattern in the peritoneum, even in the pleura and mediastinum. Uh, these are lesions that are positive with cytokeratins, with D240 or mesothelin, calretinin, WT1, uh, and uh, BAP1 is retained. Um, and they're negative usually with very P4, Mach 31, Claudin 4, and HEG1. So in fact, to the degree we had sufficient tissue, we were able to demonstrate that this was uh, positive with WT1, it was positive with mesothelin, um, and with a very low proliferation rate, we made the diagnosis of disseminated adenomatoid tumor. So uh, that is uh, a very challenging and uh, interesting walk through a, a, a clinical uh, conundrum with a patient who did not look like he had cancer. Uh, we were finally able to come to that conclusion um, and uh, save him from further aggressive treatments and potentially uh, disastrous uh, uh, secondary complications from any uh, morbidity and mortality associated with that treatment. Well, we hope that you enjoyed this case. And if you did, that you'll uh, hit the like button. Uh, and of course, you know, we welcome subscribers. We're eager to uh, put out additional videos and share with you uh, the uh, learnings from our practice and from our understanding and hope that those will be of value to you. So until next time, thanks so much for joining me.